As you know, we have series on, or from uh, gospel, not gospel, the letter, first letter of John, a series on the topic of assurance of salvation. And we already learned from this letter of first John how to test and gain that assurance of salvation, how to test our relationship towards God, other believers, towards sin. Last week we talked about our attitude towards God's word. And today we will conclude with our attitude towards this world that we live in. As I consider John's letter, I'm reminded that John writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and gives similarly clear instructions in his epistle. John knows that there is a great battle between the kingdom of light and kingdom of darkness, God's kingdom and kingdom of Satan. He knows God has deployed his church through the world, that we are engaged in battle, in the spiritual battle, and ultimately that would result in defeat for the kingdom of Satan and victory of the kingdom of God. And today we're going to talk about that John gives reassurance to the children of God and clear command regarding the world where we live in. What should be our attitude towards the world? And we find in this letter of John three truths about the world where we live in. What our attitude should be towards the world and the world or how we should react, react to the world's attitude towards us. And the first truth we find in chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. Let's read that passage. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. Do not love the world or things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away alone with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. So first, we must not love the world. Definition of the world in this context, we can conclude that John uses this world to describe spiritual system of evil. Where man is in the center and not God. Everything that is part of this fallen system, fallen system of thoughts, actions, politics, and etc. Everything in this, on this earth that does not acknowledge God as Lord, he called this world. Every thought that does not measure up to God's word, everything promoted that is not from God and his will, Everything that comes out of fallen man and the one who leads him, who is devil himself. Everything that contradicts what God has revealed about himself and his will in his word. The first reason John gives is that if anyone loves the world, love of the Father is not in him. In other words, the reason you should not love this world is that you cannot love the world and God at the same time. Love for the world pushes out love of God. And love of God pushes out love for the world. As Jesus said, no one can serve two masters. And you remember that passage. For either he will hate the one and love the other. Or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. So don't love the world because you, you would put, that would put you in the class with the God hatreds. Even though maybe you're not associated with those people. But this is the reality that John presents here. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in him. This is the first reason John gives not to love this world. Then in verse 16, 
comes the support or explanation of that first argument. The reason love for the world pushes out love of God is that all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, or as ESV translated, desires of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Leave out those three phrases in the middle of the verse 16, and it would read like this. The reason love for the world excludes love of God is that all that is in the world is not from God. In other words, just empty talk to say that you love God if you love what is not of God, which is the world. John could have rested in this case, but he continues, don't love the world because love of the world cannot coexist with love of God. He adds two more arguments, two more motivations not to love the world. Second reason in verse 17, he says, and the world passes away. And the last of it, nobody would buy stocks in the company that is for sure to go bankrupt. Nobody set up house in the place that you know for sure there is going to be flood and that house will be destroyed. Nobody would, or reasonable person, would lay up treasure where moth and rust destroys and thieves break in and steal. The world is passing away. To set your heart on it is only asking for headache and misery at the end. And that's not all. Not only the world is passing away, but also the lusts of the world. If you share the desires of the world, you will pass away. You will not only lose your treasure, you will lose your life. This is what John is talking here. If you love the world, it will pass away and take you with you. In verse 17, John says, but... He who abides, who does the will of God abides forever. The opposite of loving the world is not only loving the Father, but also doing the will of the Father. And this is the same thing that John explains. If you love God, you will love what He wills. It is empty talk to say, I love God, and I don't love what God loves. So John is saying in verse 17, if you love the world, you will perish with the world. But if you don't love the world, but if you love God, you will do his will and live for him and with him forever. And in verse 16, John gives brief description. What are the things of the world? We must not love the world because the desires of the flesh. And those desires appeal to our sinful appetites. The word for flesh refers to all improper appetites, not only improper sexual desires, but all cravings of sinful men. We must not love the world because the desires of the eyes appeal to our affections. God gave us eyes with which we can see things. But sometimes we see things that grip our affections in a sinful way. Such a beautiful person, nice home, nice car, and so on. And, and probably the biggest problem that we have in our modern society is social media and internet. And you can even watch there not something that is sinful, but you can waste your time there which we are accountable to God for. We must not love the world because the pride of life appeals to our ambitions. It refers to the man who lay 
claims to possessions and achievements which did not belong to him. In order to exalt himself, the boasting of what he has and what he does. Interestingly, these three areas of the world, temptations for loving the world, compared to the same three things which led Eve to commit sin, to disobey God in Genesis 3.6. John is telling to his beloved flock not to set their hearts on the world and the things of the world. In other words, it is warning against worldliness. Moreover, worldliness is a sign that the love of God is not in a person. We have this sense in America that you can somehow... Be true Christian and have a passionate, burning love for the world. There are some Christians who understand that they have been delivered from the wrath to come. But they do not seem to understand that Jesus died not only to deliver us from the wrath to come, but to deliver us from this present evil world. If I would to redefine or rephrase Jesus' statement in Matthew about the, the narrow and, and broad way. Based on what we see among Christians today in our modern time. It would be this. Christians would be the pass through the narrow gate and walk in a broad way. But this is not true. This is not true. There is only a narrow gate, but there is also a narrow way in Christian life. And that narrow way is way marked by God's precepts, wisdom, His word. We swim in this world, we live in this world, but we called not to be out of this world, not belong to this world. And a true Christian will not be out of this world. In the same way that a true Christian will love the Lord, he will disdain the everything that God disdains. This book actually teaches to love what God loves and to hate what God hates and we need to learn about God and things that he loves and things that he hates and yet we see so many so-called believers so wrapped in this world and the things of this world and the question for us do you long for the city whose builder and maker is God are you longing for that day when the kingdom of God will come in its fullness to this earth? When Jesus Christ will reign? Or the question to you, are, are you happy and comfortable in this present age? And you seek after the very things that the rest, who do not even profess and confess Jesus as their Lord, Seek after. And this is the problem why many Christians cannot be useful for the kingdom of God. Because they are bound to the things of this world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. This is a great divide, great separation. Every desire that you have that is not conformed to the will of God is lust of the flesh. And this, is, this should be the, the reality of our life. Everything that you see, everything that you desire. 
Bible should be open and determine whether it is a thing from God or the thing outside of the will of God. If it's outside of the will of God, this is the desire of the flesh. You're not your own. You were bought with the price. This is what scripture says. If you belong to him, everything in your life is to be guided by God's principles and God's word. Everything, the clothes that we buy, the way we take care of things, the house we owe, the car we drive, everything we ask, is this your will or God? And we need to find that in His Word. You, some of you young men here, this is a good example. When you're thinking about fighting, uh, finding the spouse or mate for your life, what are you looking for? The outwardly appearance or inwardly virtues of that girl and her character? And this is the question to us. What do your eyes chase? What does your heart long for? Treasure in heaven? Does your heart look to heaven because it's, this is where your treasure is? Or you have gathered so many jewelries and treasures around you that you cannot even get your head up to look at heaven? You have no interest in heaven. Apostle John describes the third thing, the boastful pride of life. And we can illustrate with athlete at the Olympics. He gets the gold and they interview him. How did you get this? Well, I have trained hard, trained for years. I disciplined myself. I disciplined my body and I achieved this. And thus, that little man does not understand, that even understand that he cannot breathe without God's power. And apart from God's power. And this is what pride does. We think we achieved that. And the John says this world is passing away and also its lusts. Passing away, or, or can be also understood as pushed away, being pushed down, would indicate a judgment falling upon this godless age, wicked world, that kingdom of God is advancing. And there's going to be judgment against this world. And all these things of the world are being pushed out by the judgment of God. And on that day, the only thing that will remain is that which is done and has been done in His name and for His glory. Nothing else would remain. Some young people, they perceive their life that they have so many years ahead of them. But this is not true. You should understand that this life is a vapor. Yesterday I was 9, today at 29, tomorrow I'm going to be 90. It flies. It's running from you. Death is coming and hell is moving. And judgment day is approaching. And many of you will meet your maker before you think it's time. And you will stand before God. And the question, how then shall we live? We should live between two days, the day when Jesus was crucified on that cross and the day when he's going to appear in glory. Those two days are to be the great motivation of our life. Everything else is fleeting. Everything else, we are fleeting. Your youth will be gone. You will be left with nothing. Your strength will wither. Your mind, maybe you have the greatest mind and brilliant mind in this world. But everything will be gone. 
Think about one of the greatest person in America was George Washington. And this is a true statement if I would say that. But the, if I would ask you this, have you ever mourned for his death? You would probably say never. And this is what happened with us. This is what would happen with us. Ten years after our death, no one will mourn over our death. The world is passing away. There are so many who claim to be Christians and yet live for, the, for this world. They are deceived. This world is passing and be smashed by the judgment of Christ one day. The second truth about this world we find in chapter 3 verses 11 to 13. If you can read with me chapter 3 verses 11 to 13. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one, and murder his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. And listen to this. This is, this is imperative. This is command for the church, for believers. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. Do not be surprised. A world's hatred towards us. This is command if you're a believer. John's rhetorical question for that reason, for what reason did he murder him? He talks about Cain. And it's easily to answer. Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Cain was evil and hated righteousness so greatly that he even killed his own brothers because of his righteousness. Because his brother's righteousness and his righteous deeds had rebuked him. Like Cain, the ungodly hate the righteous because through their righteous actions, they expose the false beliefs and wicked practices. Those who practice evil. The, the, the world will hate those who love Jesus. John is aware of hostility of the fallen world system against the truth and warns his brothers and sisters not to be surprised when the world would hate them. When the world would hate them. And this is what Jesus warned his disciples. Jesus was hated by this world and he reminded his disciples in the upper room that the world will hate them because it hates him. James warns that you cannot simultaneously be a friend to God and to the world. My brothers and sisters, this is the warning for us. Our lifestyle must have sharp contrast with unbelievers. And, and inevitably, it will produce hatred towards us. I remember my friend told me a story. He's a pastor right now in the Bay Area in the Silicon Valley. But before, he was, he was working for a high-tech company. And they had trip to New York for training. And after those trainings, they had free time. And all guys from his company went to strip club. And they invited him to go to strip club. Even his boss was pushing him, you have to go. And he refused. And he became so angry because all of those men were married. And now they're guilty and he's not. He was so angry to the point that he fired him. Because of that refusal to participate in the wickedness of this world. And the question to you, do you experience hatred of this world towards you? Do you relate to this command? 
Imagine this if Apostle John would appear here in this pulpit and say to this church, to believers, and say to, to us, and say this, brothers and sisters, do not be surprised when the world hates you. How we would react to that? We would look around and say, I, don't, I can't even relate to that command because there's no one in my life that would hate me. Probably there are some enemies, but not because I'm Christian, they hate me. Because I did something wrong at work, in my business, or whatever. This was a very rebuking statement for me, my dear brothers and sisters. When I was studying this passage, it was rebuking to me. I was asked, I asked this question myself. Is there anyone in this world that hate me because of my righteous life and my preaching of the gospel? Maybe we're mingled with this world to the level that based on our lifestyle, we have no difference than people of this world. Because if we are faithfully, boldly, and courageously preaching the truth that exposed the false beliefs and wickedness of people, they would hate us, for sure. When we are calling people to repentance, or, or sometimes maybe we're trying to be soft, and maybe we're ashamed of the gospel, we're trying to make gospel more attractive, and not to say to unbelievers that they're under God's wrath, and they're going to hell, and this is 100% justice. Maybe we're assimilated with this world because we don't like any tension in the relationship. And we don't preach gospel faithfully and, and, and straightforwardly that would rebuke people, that would expose their sinfulness and their wickedness. We don't like those tensions. When we think about why we should have any tensions with our neighbors or our friends or co-workers or classmates in school and college, Turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 10. I always thinking maybe this is why Jeremiah didn't have any converts in his life. But he was faithful to God and preached the truth. That God commanded him to preach. See, I have set you this day over nations, over kingdoms. And listen to this, the purpose of his proclamation. To pluck up, to break down, to destroy, and to overthrow. And after that only, to build and plant. And this is the gospel message. It has to overthrow. It has to pluck up. It has to destroy sinful desires. It has to bring the prideful heart of the person to humility and to admit that he or she deserves eternal death, eternal hell, eternal punishment. In Matthew 10, Jesus said that I came not to bring peace, but sword and division. And even close relatives can become enemies. Even in our Christian circle, because sometimes we are very tolerant to some lifestyles of other Christians that we don't like to rebuke them because we don't like any tensions. We don't like those phrases that people would say, you think you're holier than me. They hated our master and Lord without any righteous cause. 
And we have to understand, my dear friends, brothers and sisters, that our life, righteous lifestyle would never be example for unbelievers. They would never say, oh, I like that lifestyle. I want to follow that lifestyle. They would say, it's good. It's according to what you preach. They always would rebuke us if we don't live according to what we preach. But this would not be something valuable for them to follow until they're born again. So that's why John gives peace to believers. And he said here, here that those who born of God, they would listen to us. This is not our area of responsibilities. We just need to preach the truth and love people. And the most loving thing is to warn them of eternal damnation and eternal punishment. And we have to be bold and courageous to be faithful in our life, to live according to the righteousness of God, and to preach that righteousness to other people. And the last thing here, we must overcome the world with faith. This we find in chapter 5, verses 4 and 5. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. John repeated this phrase for emphasis, to emphasize the truth from the verse 1 of this chapter 5. That those who believe in Jesus Christ and having been born of God overcome the world, gaining the victory over it through their faith. The phrase our faith literally reads, the faith of us. It could refer to the subjective personal faith of individual believers or objective to the Christian faith. The faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. It is safe to see in this context of believing that John is referring not to the objective content of the gospel theology, but to subjective trust by which God makes saints overcomers, overcomers of this world. This imperative is supported, or I'm sorry, this interpretation is supported by apostle rhetorical question. Who is the one who overcomes this world? He who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Christians are victorious over overcomers from the moment of their salvation. When they are granted a faith that will never fail. To embrace the gospel. Of course. We will experience doubts. We will cry out with David. How long O Lord. Will you forget me forever. How long will you hide your face from me. In Psalm 13. But true saving faith will never fail. Because those who possess it. Have in Christ's victory. We, sh we share Christ's victory. That's why we, we will stumble, for sure. But we will not fail ultimately because of God's promise. Also, John makes emphasis on the subject or, or on the subject of the faith that is Jesus, who is the Son of God. It is impossible to have a relationship with the Father apart from the, Son, from the Son. And this is very clear from this epistle. The true Christian is going to acknowledge everything that the Scripture teach about the person of Jesus Christ. If you evaluate any cults, any false religion in a church history in the present time, they were all about person 
of Jesus Christ. Either they denied His divinity, that He's divine, He's God, or His humanity, that He's fully human. But that's not really a problem in, in our evangelical conservative movement today. Because majority of conservative evangelical Christians, they would agree, admit that God, that Jesus is God and He is fully man. He's fully God and He's fully man. But we have another problem. To accept the fullness of person of Jesus Christ, we must also accept His Lordship. But if He is Lord, we must obey Him. Jesus is the only Lord who can tell anybody what to do. And there's no way that we can take Him as a Savior, but not as Lord. You take Him... Not his Lord, your Lord, you take him, not your Savior. When he comes into your heart, into your life, everything in it will be his. It's accepting the fullness of Christ's person, of who he really is. And now the question still remains from this passage. How this faith will overcome the world, all worldly temptations. Love towards the things of this world. How we can overcome with our faith all those temptations that we've been bombarding every day in our life. To be enticed by the things of this world. By our flesh and fleshly desires. And the question or the answer to that question because of changed Affections, changed affections. Look at this same passage or same chapter, chapter 5, verse 12 and verse 13. Majority of commentators say that this is the central passage in this epistle. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. And if we go back to verse 12, whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. That faith first gives us Jesus. And then eternal life. First it gives us Jesus. Then eternal life. One thing that will be most prevalent. I guess you, you could say in the life of a true believer. Is, that, is this if you were to mention to them. That their salvation somehow was a result of anything. Or anyone other than Jesus Christ. They would become nauseous. The true Christian is going to acknowledge that nothing in their hands do they bring. It's only Christ, only Christ, and only Christ. So often people will, will say, I believe in Christ. And we ask him this question. If you would die today, where would you go? And of course I go to heaven. Why? Well, I'm trusting in Christ. Why? Why do you need eternal life? Paul Washer explaining what does it mean to trust in Christ. Once shared about old deacon in his church who said this. Listen to this carefully. Lord, I'm going to trust only in your son. And if that is not enough to save me, then I'm going to go to hell because I'm not going to trust to any other person or any other things but Christ and Christ alone for my salvation because I want to be with Christ. 
John wrote this in such a way to test ourselves if we love the world or we love Christ by trusting Him. It is so easy to take even a great confession of faith, wonderful creed, and say, I believe all that, I'm saved. No, my friend. The question, is it a a reality in your life? And is the person of Christ precious to you? Many of you are here, parents. How do you pray for your kids? I heard some of the parents pray that their kids would be great missionaries, great preachers, great evangelists. I once learned to pray for my kids differently. That Christ would be most precious to them. And that Christ is not only all you need. He is all you desire. I want to see Christ. I want to sit at his feet. I want to gaze his glory. I want Christ. Heaven is for me. Is Jesus Christ. And that one desire is so great that things like gates of pearl and streets of gold and shiny crowns mean nothing. I want to see Him. I want to be with Him. This is what we need, brothers and sisters. This is what we need to overcome the world and all its seductions and temptations. All of those things would lose power. If Christ would be most precious person for us. Remember our song that we sing. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim. In the light of his glory and grace. They would not be attractive to us. This is how we overcome the world, by loving Jesus through faith in Him. This is the faith that actually overcomes the world and all the temptations of the world. Because Christ becomes not only what we need, but what we want. We would truly become strangers and aliens for this world because like Paul, our desire would be to depart from this world and be with our Lord Jesus Christ. In my conclusion, I just want to tell you a story, short biography of C.T. Studd. This name may not be familiar to you, But C.T. Studd was a Michael Jordan and Tiger Woods of his day. He was the greatest athlete in all of England in the 19th century. He was one of the one who grew up in one of the most affluent and rich families of England. He was given privileges that it would be impossible for us to understand. He lived a life of Affluence and luxury. He was the greatest cricket player in all of England. His parents sent him to Cambridge. Where the elitist would go to school. And City Stad won fame and fortune on a cricket field that was second to none. He was the envy of the nation. Once Moody came to England and he preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. And C.T. Studd recognized that I am a hell-bound race runner. And God dramatically saved him, this famous athlete. And he committed his life to Jesus Christ and recognized that he is the precious for him. And then he decided... To go to missionary field. Not only missionary field. But he decided to go to China. 
He formed a group called the Cambridge Seven, and they were the elitist of elite who had been conquered by the grace of God. And they began to prepare for their missionary trip. And Cities Stad and other six got on a boat and they sailed to the other side of the world. They said goodbye to fame, goodbye to popularity, goodbye to fortune, goodbye to wealth. And they left it all behind and go to the mission field to, to tell people of the saving death of Jesus Christ and how precious Christ is. While City Stud was on the mission field, his father died and left him a king's ransom. He got on a boat and he sailed back to England and he took his inheritance. And in 24 hours, he gave away 90% of that vast estate. He just dissolved it, liquidated, and gave it away and got on a boat and went back to China. He was there and then... He came down to Africa. He met his wife to be. He gave her the other 10% of that vast estate. And she gave it all away to missions. After that, someone asked Sitistan, why would you make such sacrifice? Sitistan answered and said, if Jesus Christ be God and died for me then no sacrifice is too great for me to make for him if he is God and he died for me then there is no sacrifice that is too great to give to him we overcome the world by faith in Jesus Christ of who he really is, and that faith captivates our affections when Jesus becomes more precious than anything or anything in this world. But we know that our faith will grow weak sometimes. That's why we need constant reminder. And this is what we do this is what we do when we come to a lord's table we need this constant reminder of who jesus is and what he has done on our behalf just want to invite you to turn to hebrews chapter 11 and we're going to read from verse 33 up to verse 3 in chapter 12. This is, one, this is what we need when our faith becomes weak. And that's the reality of our Christian faith and Christian walk. We need constant reminder. So that's why we celebrate Lord's Supper. To remind ourselves about Jesus. Verse 33. Who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mounts of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies in flight. A woman received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the, the, the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts, and mountains, and in dens, and caves of the earth. And all these, though commanded through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, 
they should not be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great clouds of witness, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And there is a very clear command in verse 2 in this chapter. What we must do. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who is for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against him, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted in our struggle against sin. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. This is the reminder that we need to change our focus. Sometimes Jesus and his glory, when we look at Jesus and his glory, it's blurry to us. So we need God's word and we need a reminder. We need Lord's Supper to focus on Jesus, to see the brightness of his glory. And then the world with all its attractiveness would grow dim for us.